if you're coming to China and you're bringing your brand, it's important that you're not shackled to that brand's position. For example, in the 1990s, Foster's came over to China. They entered the market and they, they came in at a premium beer level. At that time in China, there were, there were literally hundreds of Chinese beers competing at the economy street level. And Foster's, of course, uh, wanted to position themselves higher than that. But that market was also saturated. Companies like Heineken, Suntory, Budweiser uh, were competing and spending a lot of money on marketing. And Foster's felt obliged to do the, to do the same. Uh, so very early on, Foster's realized that there was not much profit at the premium level and the national marketing director in the, the, the mid 90s had a proposition. He'd done some research and found that generally Chinese consumers prefer a lighter beer, both in flavor uh, and, and, and uh, color. Um, and, and he proposed a draft beer in a bottle. He, he called it Foster's Light. Um, he got the opportunity to meet with the senior directors and he presented what he thought would be a winner. That would be Foster's having a brand extension into that lower street level market. Well, he thought wrong because at that time, uh, obviously the senior management was heavily uh, connected to the brand of Foster's and felt that this was uh, disrespectful uh, and he was ridiculed and mocked for his idea to even contemplate moving the brand down into that lower street level. What's interesting about that story is that within six months of that presentation about, about the brand extension to the street level, uh, Suntory, uh, the Japanese competitor, came out with their own street level beer, a blue label beer. And that blue label beer today is one of the most popular beers uh, available uh, at corner stores. So had Foster's repositioned, or rather had a brand extension to allow them to reposition, it could have been a very different story and perhaps Foster's would still be owned by an Australian company. So that's a company that got it wrong. What about a company that got it right? Well, Pernod Ricard is one such company. One of their brands is Shivers Regal. Now, Shivers Regal uh, entered the market in the late 90s, early 2000s. This was the first Scotch whiskey to enter the market. Now, brown liquor had already been available in China um, under the, the, the brand of Cognacs and was used as a, a really a premium type of liquor, but Scotch was new. And one way that they were able to literally create a new market was to make it accessible, and in this case palatable, they introduced green tea. So green tea as a mixer became the standard. And if you go to any KTV karaoke bar uh, around China today, uh, green tea and shivers is the mainstay of, of the drink of choice. Now to the purists, and, and certainly to James and John Shivers, the founders of Shivers, uh, this kind of combination, the mixture of, of their scotch with a green tea uh, would be appalling. Well, it was uh, perhaps appalling to the purist, but not to the shareholders. Uh, Shivers has dominated at, uh, ever since, and today's is one of the most popular Scotch whiskies that you can buy in China. Now, that being said, uh, of course, there is trouble now because Shivers now wants to reposition itself. Uh, the brand has essentially uh, trained Chinese not to appreciate scotch for what it is. By mixing it, obviously they're losing the flavor. But it does allow for other brand extensions, uh, Royal Saloon and uh, an older year Shivers to enter the market. And, and that's, that's having some great success at this moment. So that's an example of two Western companies, one that was unsuccessful and one that was successful. What about local companies? Well, one of the, probably one of the most famous brands uh, in China is Haiye, a white goods manufacturer. Uh, today they make just about every product imaginable. Back in 1984, they were really known for refrigerators. In 1984, there were over 300 locally produced refrigerator brands and Haiye came into this market, which are obviously very, very saturated. By the late 80s and early 90s, they'd expanded into the uh, other products, including washing machines. And this is where they really did very well against the, the international brands like Whirlpool and GE. Rather than get stuck in tradition, because ultimately they didn't have tradition, they uh, really connected to what the consumer demanded rather than what uh, the history of the, the company demanded. For example, in rural Sichuan at that time, back in the, in the 90s, uh, there was a lot of complaints 
uh, complaints that machines, that the Hi'er machines were breaking down. Zhang Raimin, the, the CEO of Hi'er at the time, uh, sent, dispatched some service technicians uh, to, to find out what was wrong with the product, the washing machines. They came back and they reported the news. You see, the problem was that the locals in rural Sichuan were using the washing machine to both wash clothes and also wash vegetables. Uh, in this case, sweet potatoes and peanuts. Now, many uh, people, many of his staff, many of his senior managers at, at that time said, well, the solution is obvious. We need to re-educate the market so that they don't use our product for washing vegetables. But Zhang, the CEO at the time, said, no, no, that's, that's basing things on tradition. Let's listen to the customer. And as a consequence, uh, Zhang spoke to his engineers and they redeveloped and redesigned the washing machines so that the holes and the pipes were larger so that the mud wouldn't get stuck. And today, there are labels on higher washing machines, mostly in rural China, that say mostly for washing clothes, sweet potatoes and peanuts. So if you really want to be successful in China, what's very important is don't be shackled to your, your brand's position back home. Understand that China is a completely different market and then perhaps one day it will be your dominating market.